the yearbook room looking at an art piece that comments on racial and gender bias in art history. That's right, it is Faith Ringgold's Dancing at the Louvre. It is part of the French collection, part one, number one. It was created in 1991, made of acrylic on canvas, tie-dyed, and has a pieced fabric border. So let's talk about the artist, Ringgold. She grew up in Harlem during the Great Depression. Her father had been a minister and her mother was a fashion designer. Her mother taught her how to sew, in which we can see it was heavily influential to her piece, Dancing at the Louvre. Ringgold's grandmother taught her how to quilt, a family tradition that was taught by her mother who was a slave. Quilts were especially important during times of slavery and conducting the Underground Railroad, as they allowed for visual communication acting as a storyboard. One of her first quilting pieces, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima in 1983, comments on the marketing stereotype of Jemima Blakey. The piece has fabric squares, painted portraits accompanied with text, which heavily influenced Dancing at the Louvre. Dancing at the Louvre shows the fictional story of Willa Marie Simone. It's part of a series that shows her adventure in Paris as an aspiring black artist and businesswoman. In this piece, she brought her friend and her three children to the museum. What's interesting is that it's based off a time in Ringgold's life. She notes that she went on a trip to Paris with her mother and two kids. On this trip, they visited the Louvre Museum. The kids searched for the Mona Lisa. However, on their quest, they were dancing and running, which obviously broke the rules of the museum. Their grandmother followed from a distance behind them due to embarrassment from their rule breaking. Exactly, and we see similarities between this memory and the fictional story of Willa Marie Simone. In this story, Willa brought her friend Marika and her three girls to see the Mona Lisa. And they're dancing in front of the artworks by da Vinci, most notably the Mona Lisa. It appears they almost have become part of the show. Drawing from Ringgold's memory, she states that in the search of the Mona Lisa, Ringgold and her sister were running around breaking many rules, which drew in a following crowd. It's important to realize it was a time of the civil rights movement, and especially being a minority in a dominantly white and French country, breaking social norms and customs. The quilt combines representational painting, African-American quilting techniques, and writing a, to develop a narrative format that essentially rewrites the past. It is truly successful in the combination of a modern art and African-American culture to comment on the bias that dominate in art history. And this bias is how the art world is dominated by white men, and this has caused difficulty for her as she is, of course, a black woman. Her work marks a transition towards postmodernism in the 1980s and 1990s. During the modernism period, artworks emphasize autonomy and universal meaning. However, this piece is unique. Ringel emphasized instead this racial and gender bias and what can be considered art. But what comes to mind is how she exactly does this. She appropriates narrative, non-Western traditions, as well as the past snippets of her life in order to provide a perspective that is not white nor male. She creates this piece with a central image that is made from acrylic paint on canvas, which shows her skills on Western art. Surrounding the canvas is a cloth border that contains text on the story of Willa and stitched it with traditional quilting techniques. The choice to make a quilt refers to her past and tradition. Quilting was considered a feminine art where women created quilts away from men. From there, they would tell young girls stories about family and culture, further developing and maintaining family relationships. The key takeaway is that this piece was not made for traditional use of a quilt. She made this piece to publicly challenge the traditional Western expectations on what art is and who makes it. Now we're looking at a different piece, but one still related. This is the elephant mask from the Bamalike in the Cameroon, Western Grassfields region. It was made in the 19th to 20th century from wood, woven raffia, cloth, and beads. The Bamalike kingdom are the people of Cameroon, which is located in Central Africa. They are led by a fawn or a king. The fawn is a divine representative of the ancestors and gods, but it is important to note that he is not in control of human behavior. The fawn is protected by a group of skilled warriors called the Kuosi Society. Now a group composed of wealthy men, the organization was made to enforce the king's rulership, secure arms during war, reinforce the power of the king, levy taxes, and regulate the class system. They were closed off to outsiders. The elephant mask was worn by the Kuosi Society. During special occasions, elephant dancers would masquerade and enter dancing fields. 
known as the Tso, the elephant dance allow for the entertainment and communication through spirits. The dancers would pretend to be a spirit, whether animal, human, or composite. That's right. It's an incredible dance where masks have a specific spirit with different personalities. Yes. So for animal spirits, the dancer would have a mask to show off the positive aspect of animals. For human spirits, it was likely recalling a famous community leader and could teach young children morals. But in terms of the elephant mask, it was considered a composite spirit. The mask has both elephant features like trunks and ears and an abstract human mouth, nose, and eyes. The masks were made out of perishable materials, so they were not made to last forever. Once a new mask was made, the spirit was believed to have transferred to the new mask before the old mask got discarded. The artist, although unknown to us, used palm leaf textile with glass beads adorning the cloth panels that made up the mask's trunk. These masks were beautifully decorated. As mentioned, they look like elephants, but contain human-like features. The ears, when in dance, would even flap with movement. Wow, that's incredible. The bead configurations especially catch our eye. We see that the tiny beads are made from bright colors that show the artistic variation and innovation by the artist. Each color did have a certain association. For example, black meant the relationship between the living and the dead. White referred to ancestors and potent medicines. Red symbolized life, women, and the institution of kinship. The mask, use, the mask uses tiny beads to make the intricate designs. Many of the beads make up many isosceles triangles. It is important to understand that the beads were also considered as a form of currency. So with that many beads, it is obvious that it was made to show off the wealth of the king. And in this case, it was made to show off the power of the king especially. Animals like the leopard and elephant were associated with leadership and the ego of the fawn. They remind the Bamaliki people of the fawn's divine power. Although it is currently in the Brooklyn Museum encased in glass, it was meant for a dance. The masquerade that the Kwosi Society performed were accompanied by drums that further attempted to recreate the power of the elephant. They wouldn't just wear a mask. A leopard coat was also worn with a red feather headdress, a leopard skin pelt, as well as a full body costume. So when comparing dancing at the Louvre, the two pieces are very similar. Indeed, they both celebrate the idea of dance. In Ringold's work, we see figures dancing and breaking rules. In the elephant mask, the key function was to be part of the dance, but they also call upon tradition that give homage to their ancestors. Ringold uses a quilting technique passed through her family, and the elephant mask, on the other hand, honors the fawn, a representative of the ancestor as well as the spirits. Mm -hmm.